class, I wanted to do a video here on immunity to introduce uh, one, just do a general overview of the immune system and kind of the main concept and relationship between all the structures of immunity, but then also to focus on what I think is one of the more complicated topics of this chapter, which is T cell activation and trying to, to figure out the relationship between the MHC1 and two molecules and the CD4 and CD8 molecules on the different cells. So let's start with the basics of immunity. So if you think about what are the different pathogens that exist in the world that can cause you harm. So we have bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoans, parasites, prions, all of these different things. And now in the overwhelming majority of cases, these things are not harmful. And if you think about with bacteria, the um, beneficial microbiota of your gut, a lot of talk about gut bacteria. The overwhelming majority of these are, um, I guess, the bacteria as a whole are probably neutral, but then many of these are beneficial for you. Uh, there are viruses that attack human cells. There are viruses that attack bacterial cells. There are viruses that attack different things. So not every bacteria, virus, fungus, protozoan, or parasite is bad some are even beneficial. And so when we talk about the immune system in fighting some of these pathogenic organisms, your immune system doesn't target bacteria specifically per se or viruses spe specifically per se. It attacks things on these cells called antigens. And so the word antigen is gen for generate, anti means against. So they're called antigens because these, these little markers, these flags on these pathogens <clears throat> generate an attack response, generate an anti-response from your body. So that's why we call them antigens. So these are markers on these cells <clears throat> that your body will fight against. Now we've already introduced this concept in the blood chapter is that you have self antigens and non self antigens. So a self antigen is a flag that your own cells wave that say, hey, I am on your team, don't attack me. Non self antigens are treated as foreign. They are treated, anything foreign is treated as an enemy. And so your body is designed to attack it. So you have to think from the perspective of immunity of your immune system. Anything that is not of you is an enemy and must be eradicated and eliminated immediately. So when we look at immunity, we can break it down into two or all the structures of immunity, all of the, um, all of the processes that contribute to immunity, this, these protective effects, is we have innate versus adaptive, so two divisions here. So innate, also known as nonspecific, and adaptive, known as specific or acquired. So if we just take the terms here, innate and adaptive, innate means these are things that you are born with. Adaptive or acquired means that it develops over time. It gets more specialized. You don't, you aren't just born with it. In a sense, it has to be trained. It has to be used. So innate things like the skin, you just have skin. It just is a barrier. Um, innate would be the equivalent of the walls of your house. When you buy a house, it has walls and the walls by their very nature help to separate the outside from the inside. Um, and then we look at adaptive and your body adaptive would be things like um, you hear about releasing antibodies you have to have encountered the enemy before you release these antibodies. So maybe this is something the equivalent of, um, you buy your house, it has the walls, but then um, maybe you saw that your back door was broken into one night. And so because of that, you decided to get a um, security system and you specifically upgraded the locks to your back door to ensure that wouldn't happen. So that's why we say that the innate, the walls are nonspecific. It's not, the walls don't 
exclusively prevent one type of intruder or one type of threat. They just walls just prevent everything, either inside or outside. Or then if you think like your security system, it is designed to specifically target one thing. And so obviously with your security system, if it didn't just come with your house, you had to acquire it, you had to purchase it. And then within these two broad divisions, there are three lines of defense. And you can kind of think of these as a progression. So let's look at um, uh, the, the two divisions here, innate and adaptive, and then of course the three lines of defense. So we can see here in this chart, you have the immune system at the top and then divided into one half is the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. You can see the description here. And what I have circled are the three lines of defense. So here, the first two lines of defense are underneath innate immunity. So the first line of defense is the skin and mucous membranes. And just as it says, this does the majority of the protecting, the majority of preventing entry. That is the best um, that is the best first step, let's just prevent the pathogen from getting in. If a pathogen does breach your skin or mucous membrane, well then you have the, what's called the non-specific internal defenses. This would be the second line of defense. And you can see, for example, these are non-specific phagocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils. These have been introduced in the blood chapter. We then have different chemicals, interferons, which interfere with viral replication. We have pyrogens, which contribute to your fever. And so you can see that here. Um, you also have the complement system, which you'll read about in your book. And then these physiological responses, I mentioned fever and inflammation. And then if that doesn't work, we then go to the third line of defense. These are the specific cells. This is why you call the uh, adaptive response the specific immunity, and these would be your T cells or T lymphocytes and your B cells, your uh, B lymphocytes. So you can see we have innate and adaptive and then the three lines of defense within there. First line of defense, second line of defense, and then third line of defense. <laughs> so let's put this all together in the big picture. So I want you to think of your immune system like a pyramid and you want to climb up the pyramid. The higher up you are on the, the pyramid, the better your attack system. So you can kind of think of this just like you would in, I don't know, military terms, the way that the police work. So you start with the first line of defense. This is like the old lady who lives down the street who's super nosy. This is neighborhood watch. Okay, we all know that the old lady's not gonna stop some little kids from breaking into somebody's house, but old lady is always watching. She's always peeking through uh, her, her blinds in her front, front door window. So always watching, always there, always that first line of defense. Because what is the advantage here? The first line of defense, it's not that it's super powerful, but it's always there and it can activate the second line of defense. So this would be the old lady calling the police. So then we've progressed up, oops, we've progressed up the pyramid into the second line of defense. Police show up, they go to the house, they see that yes, in fact, somebody has broken in, but it turns out it's not just some little kid, it's actually a highly advanced terrorist who is planning some sort of big explosive device. Well, now the second line of defense says, okay, well, we could have handled it if it was just a regular pathogen. <clears throat> but unfortunately, this pathogen is, is more advanced than what we can handle. So then the second line of defense will then progress into and activate the third line of defense because these are your specialists. This is calling in the SWAT team. This is calling in the bomb squad. And even within the third line of defense, there's a pro uh, progression here. But what I want you to see is that as you move up from the first second to the third line of defense, the result of the third line of defense is to actually enhance the first line of defense. So you, you see a positive feedback mechanism here, first, second, third, and then the result of the third line of defense enhances the first line of defense and then as it per keeps progressing that way. So let's be even more specific here. So let's look at the bottom of the pyramid. These would be your non-specific defenses. So we already said the skin, the mucous membrane, your neutrophils, macrophages, antigen presenting cells, fever, inflammation. Well, really the advantage here is that we want to 
to kind of um, support enough, give enough time until until the helper T cells are activated. And the helper T cells do just what their name says, is they help the immune response. And what ultimately do we want to happen? What ultimately are we trying to help? We're trying to help the B cells. The B cells are the top of the pyramid. When the B cells get activated, they are now called plasma cells. And what is the advantage here is at the top of the pyramid, we release antibodies. And you can see the antibodies, the result of the antibodies is actually to enhance the nonspecific defenses. And so then it starts all over again. So now that we've released the antibodies, the nonspecific defenses get more powerful, which then we're going to activate more helper T cells, which means we activate more B cells into plasma cells, which means we release more antibodies, increase that antibody titer uh, uh, more rapidly, helping you to more rapidly eliminate that pathogen. So it gives you the context of this chapter. All of these different structures that are introduced, you can see their relationship. So as we move into the basics of adaptive immunity, because I think you'll find it with the non-specific RNA that's pretty straightforward. This is what it is. This is its definition. This is what it does. This is the skin. This is what it does. These are the mucous membranes. This is what they do. These are, this is the complement system. These are interferons. These are, this is fever. This is what it does. So I want to move into the basics of adaptive immunity because this is where I think things get confusing and it's also using terminology in ways that you've never heard before. I think with the non-specific, you at least are more familiar with these terms. So let's introduce the basics of adaptive immunity. So first, you need to see that when we look at adaptive immunity that we saw before in that flowchart is that you have T cells and you have B cells. So you know this is in the realm of adaptive immunity or specific. But with T cells, we call the T cells the cell-mediated immunity because T cells interact with other cells directly. So it's cell to cell. Within the division of T cells, you have helper T cells, you have cytotoxic T cells, you have memory T cells, and you have regulatory T cells. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the first two. So a lot of things here, I'm going to say this on the slide, a lot of this information you just need to, you just need to remember, you just have to memorize. So helper T cells are also known as CD4 cells. I don't really care that you go into the details of CD4 and you see CD8. I just need you to know which one is matched with which. But CD4 is just a special type of marker on helper T cells. So helper T cells also known as CD4. And with the helper T cells, uh, think of them in general, in general, think of them in general as the general. So helper T cells, the best way to remember them are using those military language, they are the generals. What does a general do? A general, you're not really thinking of a general as being um, on the front lines, the general now sitting back, uh, surveying the entire, the entire battlefield and is providing assistance and is activating the people when they need to be activated. Cytotoxic T cells, also known as C8 cells, once again, based on those markers. And so if uh, the way that I remember this, uh, kind of silly here, is um, if you look at helper T cells, if you draw a four like this, so CD4, all you have to do is just extend the line and you now have an H. So that's how you can remember helper T cells are CD4. And if you look at cytotoxic T cells, if you think of an eight, well, what is an eight except a bunch of C's for cytotoxic? One C, a backward C, another C, and another backward C. So that's how you can connect your four to your H and your cytotoxic, your C, uh, to your eight. <clears throat> you can see that your cytotoxic T cell C8, these are your hand to hand combat specialists. So they actually do confront the enemy face to face and eliminate it. With B cells, this is also known as your humoral immunity or antibody mediated immunity, it does exactly what it says. The B cells release antibodies. So, as I mentioned, B cells are activated to become plasma cells, and the plasma cells are your 
but I think of them as your missile launchers. So they sit back, they push buttons, and they launch missiles. So of course, as I said, your book will go into more detail on each of these, but this is just the basics. This is just the overview. So make sure you spend some time on this slide just connecting these terms. T cells helper and cytotoxic helper or CD4, cytotoxic or CD8. B cells are activated into plasma cells and they release your antibody. So you really need to, 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 to know which ones are which or else you will get confused. So still, when we're looking at the basics here, these are terms that are further, um, more fully described in the book. But when we talk about adaptive immunity, remember, this is acquired. You have to, this is only strengthened through interaction. So you have to use these lymphocytes. You have to actually encounter the specific antigens that they, that they are designed for for um, a response to happen. So all lymphocytes must be tested to be immunocompetent. So you can see immuno, uh, immunity competent means functional, so immunocompetent. And this is both due to positive and negative selection. So it's important to realize that with lymphocytes, they are specific, meaning if you are an individual lymphocyte, let's say you are a specific individual T cell, you only attack one specific type of antigen. You are only designed to attack E. coli, or you are only designed to attack uh, whatever strain of the flu virus uh, that, that you are designed for. So if you are designed to just attack E. coli, you will not respond to um, C. difficile. So first, you need to understand that specific idea. So once again, if you are a bomb deactivation specialist, that is the only thing you are trained to do. You are not trained to do anything else. If you are um, an Olympic sprinter, you are not trained or designed to run, uh, to run the marathon. Well, but realize that with a lymphocyte, the, the way that these... Um, specifics are designed is really just probability, just the way that the DNA is set up in that lymphocyte, which means that there are chances that you could have a T cell that just randomly happens to not respond to any antigen at all, any bad antigen, which of course is a problem because that means you're sleeping on the job and you're useless, or you may just due to probability, be set up to respond to self-antigens and attack your own cells, which is very bad because now this is friendly fire, which means that you are also useless. So when we say that lymphocytes must be tested to be immunocompetent, we have what's called positive versus negative selection. So positive selection means that the the lymphocytes are tested, they're kind of trained. This is in training in your thymus or in your bone marrow, is that they are trained to ensure that they first do respond to antigens. So positive selection, we want to ensure that you do respond to an antigen. If you don't respond to an antigen, you're eliminated. But then not only do we wanna ensure that you respond to an antigen, we also want to ensure that you don't respond to self-antigen. So that's negative selection. So first, you need to respond to an antigen, positive selection. Negative selection means that we are eliminating, of those lymphocytes, we are eliminating the ones that then respond to your own cells. So at the end of positive and negative selection, we only have lymphocytes that are immunocompetent. They do respond, that they only respond to non-self antigens. That is the result of positive and negative selection. And then we also need to understand that T cells must be activated before B cells are activated to release antibodies. And this goes back to the pyramid, that progression of the pyramid. And so activation occurs upon first exposure to an antigen, which is called the antigen challenge. And then we need to know that lymphocytes then proliferate what's called clonal selection into active and memory cells. And I'll give you an analogy on these. 
So just remember, before we look at the analogy, before we look at the analogy, let's just remember these two things. So T cells must be activated before B cells are activated to release antibodies. So the first exposure is the antigen challenge. <clears throat> so that's when that specific T cell first meets its specific antigen. And then once activated, once activated, that lymphocyte will proliferate, it will divide, that's called clonal selection because now you have, um, your body has activated that, that specific group of specific T cells um, or lymphocytes, because um, this would be true of B cells as well. Um, your body has now activated that specific group of specific lymphocytes to grow and divide to fight that specific antigen. So this is what I call the bakery analogy. So let's say that you are a chef and your specialty is cakes. So first, and remember, we're just gonna match our terms that we just looked at. So if you are the chef, you first must be competent to bake all types of cakes. So not only uh, do you need to make good quality chocolate cakes, you also need to not make roast beef. So you need to be competent and focused to bake um, not just cakes, but also specific types of cakes. And this is because if you are a chef, your job is to sell cakes. So you don't know every day that you wake up and go into the restaurant, you don't know which type of customer is gonna come in. You don't know what type of cake is needed to meet the needs of the customers for that day. So specific customers only want specific types of cakes. So the chef must be competent to bake all types of cakes, must be ready to bake all types of cakes because specific customers only want specific types of cakes. And so here's the key. The baker will only bake one cake of a certain type until a customer challenges that chef to bake that specific cake. So think of all the different cakes, chocolate cake, angel food cake, red velvet cake, regular white chocolate cake, German chocolate cake, et cetera, et cetera. You don't go and bake a full days or weeks or months worth of, worth of those specific cakes. You only make them when you have been challenged or when it has been requested by a specific customer. Maybe you make one of each cake just to display in your display case when they walk in and they go, oh, that looks good. I want more of that one. You don't, you don't make the full supply up front. You just have these specific examples. And then when that specific customer challenges you to bake that specific cake, then you will make more clones of that cake. And so that is that clonal activation. So once that customer comes in and says, I would like, um, I would like angel food cake stuffed with strawberries. And you go, well, I can do that. And so then you work, walk in the back, you go, well, how many do you need? I need a thousand of them. You go, oh dear. So then you walk into the back and you start making 1,000 angel food cakes stuffed with strawberries. You don't make the thousand ahead of time, you wait until it's needed. So then the baker will make more clones of that cake. Some of the clones, some of those uh, daughter cakes that you make will be for purchase, and this is the equivalent of the active lymphocytes, and some you're gonna put in the freezer for selling later, and these would be the memory lymphocytes. Because once you've had that random customer come in who wants, angel food cake, half chocolate, stuffed with strawberries, with blueberries on top. You go, well, he wanted a thousand of them today. I may not ever encounter this again, but just in case, I'm gonna bake some extra and I'm gonna put them in the freezer so I don't get overwhelmed the next time that this specific random customer comes in. So these would be the memory lymphocytes. So you can see the chef must be competent to bake all types of cakes because you don't know what type of customer is going to come in. 
specific customers only want specific types of cakes so you can only meet the needs specific cakes only meet the needs of specific customers and the baker will only bake one cake of a certain type until a customer challenges or requests that chef to bake that specific cake and then that chef will make multiple copies of that one specific cake that was requested those are the clones some of them are going to be for purchase immediately those would be the active lymphocytes and some are going to go into the freezer for selling later and those would be the memory lymphocytes so that gives you an idea of what the activation of t-cells look like <clears throat> so let's look at it specifically so t-cells must be presented an antigen before activation so remember if you're not the t-cell is not going to be activated until that specific antigen has been encountered. It's too many resources to be activated and produce those daughter cells up front. You have to wait until the antigen has been presented. So how does presentation happen? Presentation of antigens happen, um, the antigens are presented along something called MHC molecules, major histocompatibility complex molecules. So there are MHC1 molecules and there are MHC2 molecules. This is one of those things you're just going to have to memorize. Just You have to know that MHC1 molecules are, are found in and are used by all nucleated cells. So if you are a cell with a nucleus, you present antigens along MHC1 molecules. However, when we look at MHC2 molecules, MHC2 molecules, you can think of them as more specialized. They are used only by antigen presenting cells known as APCs. Now, realize that some of your antigen presenting cells, um, <coughs> there are um, these uh, dendritic cells found in the skin. Uh, let's see. Um, certain type of macrophages. These have MHC2, but since they're nucleated, they also have MHC1 molecules. So just remember the take home message here for these definitions. If you are a nucleated cell, you have MHC1. If you are what's called a, an APC, an antigen presenting cell, then you are an MHC2. <coughs> Like I said, the MHC2 is just more specialized. So here's the key. You can have the same antigen presented by MHC1 molecules or MHC2. And so each antigen presented by MHC molecules has a specific message. So I think about this in the realm of zombies. So if you look here on the left, you know, this is usually always um, a scene in a, in a zombie movie where somebody gets infected and you can see that they're starting to turn into a zombie. <clears throat> so if you are this guy on the left here, clearly you are zombified, you are infected. What is the message that you are presenting? You are saying, I am a zombie, kill me. Versus if you see this nice little girl with a bloody axe and a zombie head, what message is she saying? She's saying, I'm not a zombie. I have killed a zombie. Let me show you how to do it. Let me take you to one. So in both cases, we are dealing with pathogens. We are dealing with, say, infected cells or pathogenic cells. But the message is different whether we're looking at MHC1, which would be here, our zombie guy on the left, versus MHC2, which is our zombie hunter girl on the right. <clears throat> so let's think about this. So let's look here. <clears throat> so when we look at this, we have our zombie guy, versus our cytotoxic T cells. And we have our zombie hunter interacting or versus our helper, helper T cells. So when we think about this, what is gonna be the response in both cases? So 
let's look at the first column here. So here are our T cells. So we already said these are the cytotoxic T cells. Sorry, the uh, words didn't carry over. Let's see if I can do that real quick. Make a quick little edit here. So when we look at the activation of T cells, let's think about, just take a moment and think about what is the response in both cases? So remember, this is MHC1. Actually drawing that. So this is MHC1, and these are antigens presented along MHC2. So when we look here on the first row, MHC1, Think about this. So MHC1 molecules interact with cytotoxic T cells. If this antigen presented along MHC1 is saying, I'm infected, kill me, what do you think the cytotoxic T cells are going to do? Well, they are immediately going to kill this infected cell. If we look here at MHC2 molecules, they interact with helper T cells. <clears throat> so those would be your CD4 markers. What is the message here? She's saying, I'm not a zombie, don't kill me. Let me show you where they are. So you can see in this case, the helper T cells, when they interact with MHC2, they're not going to kill the cell that's presenting that antigen along MHC2. They're gonna say, thank you for the information. We're gonna pass that on to our to our cytotoxic T cells. We're gonna pass that information on to our B cells. Because remember, the helper T cells are the generals. So just know you gotta connect MHC1 molecules to cytotoxic T cells, and you need to connect MHC2 molecules to helper T cells. Just memorize that. MHC1 to cytotoxic T cells, MHC2 to helper T cells. And just if you understand that and you know the role of the cytotoxic versus the helper T cell, you understand the response. MHC1 says, I'm infected, kill me. So the cytotoxic T cells interact, boom, we kill you. MHC2 say, don't kill me. I've encountered the enemy. This is what they look like. This is how you kill them. This is where they are. The helper T cells say, thank you for the information. We're gonna pass that on to our, to our foot soldiers. So this slide just summarizes all of that. So MHC messages, MHC1, I'm infected, kill me, CD8 cells, MHC2, don't shoot, this is what the enemy looks like, activate CD4. And realize that full activation of either T cell, whether it's cytotoxic or helper, requires two signals, first signal or a second, and a second signal. This is sort of like taking the safety off of your gun. So you have your gun drawn, you take the safety off, and then you've got, that would be in response to that second, second signal, now you're ready to be activated. Your book goes into more detail about the different signals, but just know that it is a two-step process. And just to kind of summarize, this will be the last little statement here. B cells also require a first and second, second signal, but do not need to be presented an antigen first. And your book will explain why that is. It's just B cells interact with antigens differently, but they still must have a first and second signal. And this is the big take home here. Helper T cells are required for the activation of both cytotoxic T cells and B cells. So how the question that I want to leave you with, based on this final little point, that helper T cells are required for the activation of both cytotoxic T cells and B cells, I want you to think about HIV AIDS, human immunodeficiency virus. HIV targets and inhibits the helper T cells. HIV, the virus, infects and inhibits the helper T cells. So based on that information, think about why HIV is an immunodeficiency virus. What about HIV with it targeting the helper T cells means that, what does it actually do to the person infected with HIV? So it's important to realize that like most, you don't really die of HIV, you die of other opportunistic infections because HIV has suppressed your immune system. So as long as you know, so if you think about HIV and we go all the way back here, HIV blocks this step of the pyramid. So think about 
all of the results, all of the negative results of that inhibition of helper T cells. So that is all that I have for you on this little bit of information. I hope that that uh, clarified some of these things. And as always, just reach out to me if you have any questions.